Alright guys, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, shakirin wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidu wa sayyidu wa sayyidu muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasleem al kathira uh, Apologies for the late start and of course my, my I was away for a few weeks as well uh, and apologies for not getting the mic working Omar is in here today so he does all that kind of stuff but inshallah next week we'll have the mic working as well inshallah uh, We are of course on week number four of our course on the book by Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali called um, al uh, Mahajja fi Sayyid Laddulja, which is the book on the Mahajja, meaning the, the clear way, and the Sayyid is the journeying, and the Dulja, if you remember, is the last part of the night. And so translated as journey to Allah, but of course it means much more than that, as we've been covering for our last uh, three or four weeks. Uh, as a quick recap before we move on, inshallah, to today's session. Uh, let's remember that the, the entire focus of this book is on a single hadith. And this hadith in which the Prophet of Allah says, Lam minkum amaluhu, That none of your actions will be enough for you. Meaning your actions will not save you. Your actions will not be the cause for you to enter into Jannah. And Sahaba, they, was, they said, Ya Rasulullah, Wala anta, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. And he said, Wala and not even me, except if Allah was to show me with His mercy and His grace. And then he said, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَالِبُوا وَغْدُوا وَرُوحُوا وَشُؤْ مِنَ دُلْجُ In one narration. Another one. Uh, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَالِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالْغَدْوَةِ وَرُوحَةِ وَشُؤْ مِنَ دُلْجُ And then another narration when the Prophet of Allah says أَحَبَ الْأَمَانِ اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُوا إِنْ قَلْبِ So the first ones are the same thing. The Prophet of Allah is saying or a similar thing. فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَالِبُوا Our session today is on what that in fact means. So our chapter 3 is the meaning of سَدِّدُوا وَقَالِبُوا But in a very basic sense, we covered the, the meaning of the word in our, in our first class, or second class, you remember. Who remembers the meaning of سَدِّدُوا? Where does that come from? سَدِّدُوا تَسْدِيد سَدَاد like Allah in the Quran says, O oh, you believe for Allah, وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا Speak straight words. Yeah? Uh, and all of you should know because we learned a hadith, all of us, a dua all of us on our first week. Which dua did, Allah, did the Prophet teach Ali to say? Very good. Allah mahdini wa saddidni. Same word. Oh Allah, guide me and set me straight. Then the Prophet Allah says, وَذْكُرْ بِالْهُدَى and when you think of that, think about the straight road. And think of that, think about the? Good, very good. Straightness of an arrow, meaning sadadi. So, saddidu wa qaribu. But together they mean be balanced. Be firm and be balanced. Yeah? So, and then we, we went through uh, some things about the history of what we, the history of the book. So, every book that we study or read has of course a context and we spoke about events in the life of Ibn Abdul uh, Hanbali before his birth and during his time as well uh, the cataclysmic changes in the Muslim world with the Mongol invasion uh, with the Black Death all of these were big events and so these events of course inform influence the way that the author would approach his material so we shouldn't imagine, therefore, that any text we read suddenly came out of thin air, as if it just suddenly appeared. There is a context behind the authoring of that text, and so this, the same is true for this text. Uh, and so, um, I think, I mean, the way that I look at it is that hadith as significant as this one has, of course, great relevance in our context today for the latest book that I wrote, because I speak about this hadith at length in my book, but from a different context, meaning because of the fact that Christian missionaries have this claim, <coughs> false claim against Islam, that Muslims are reliant on their deeds. They assume that because they see us doing good deeds, like five pillars of Islam and praying and fasting and hajj, whatever, they think, look at them over there, they rely on their deeds, we rely on the salvation of Jesus Christ. That's how they create this juxtaposition. Uh, but it's incorrect. Because this hadith is telling us that it's not your deeds that will in fact save you except by the mercy and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have, we have a job to tell people what the true meaning of this hadith is and what our faith is. But in Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali's time, 
you know, what would be the significance of this hadith? Well, many, many things. Because remember, Ibn Rajab, in fact, in the beginning part of his book, speaks about the fact that you could have people, right, who could, over, who could rely on their deeds at the expense of their mu'amalat, at the expense of their character and their behavior and their dealings with people. People could say, you know what, I've, I've fasted all, all week or all month or all year. I've, I've prayed so many prayers and so many fasting, so much dhikr. But what if that person uh, is an abuser? That person is violent towards innocent people. What if that, that person uses bad language? What about all those other things that affect his dealing with other people? So if the Prophet of Allah is saying your deeds not by themselves are going to save you except by the mercy of Allah, the whole point is that you look at the whole thing holistically in its totality. So we spoke about that in our first week. Then we spoke about what the meaning of fadl is. What is the meaning of grace? What is the meaning of divine grace? How do we attain to divine grace? What, is, what, 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 we, what must we do to attain that grace? And so one of the key things was the hadith when the Prophet told Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Ya Mu'adh, akhlas deenak, yakfik al-amul al-qalila, kama qal. Mu'adh, be sincere in your deen, and a few actions will suffice you. So, now again, this could be misunderstood by people. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that rather than praying five times a day, you know, pray once a day, but pray once a good day. Well, you know, one good prayer in the day, one sincere prayer. It doesn't mean that. It means fulfill all of your obligations. How do we know that? Remember the hadith when the Prophet of Allah says that Allah says that uh, Whoever shows enmity to my wali, I declare war against him. وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيْهِ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ And the servant doesn't come close to me by anything that I love more than the fara'il. What I've made obligatory upon him, meaning the five daily prayers and the zakat and the fasting and hajj, I mean the, the, the obligations of Islam. And then he continues to draw close to me by the nawafir, by the voluntary acts of worship, until I love him. And when I love him, I become the eyes by which he sees and the ears by which he hears and the feet by which you walk. Meaning, uh, Allah guides your seeing and your hearing and your, and your step. That's the meaning of the of that last part of the hadith. Allah guides your actions, you know. So, um, so we shouldn't misunderstand this hadith either because it's saying to us, therefore, that, uh, you know, the, the most important acts of worship to do are ones that Allah made obligatory upon us. And then after that, from the nawafil, from the sunnah and the nawafil, uh, uh, the Prophet told Mu'ad ibn Jabal, be sincere in your deen and a few actions will suffice you. So, for example, a person who prays two rakat salah, you know, but he prays with a full deliberation and khushur, and those two rakats could be worthier than a person who prays a hundred rakats, and his completely mind is completely somewhere else. No concentration, no understanding, nothing. Allah is concerned about ihsan of deeds. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْحَيَاةِ لِبْلُوكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ Not أَكْثَرُ أَحْسَنُ who, to those who are best in deeds, not, not those who are most in deeds, yeah? So therefore, it's about the quality of, of a person's actions. Um, likewise, we spoke about the fact about not being overbearing. So for example, when the Prophet, and then we covered something in the first or second week, when the Prophet of Allah says that, um, uh, you know, don't uh, let, uh, don't make, um, don't be, what's the hadith? Um, you know, don't go to an extreme in your religion. Because no one goes to an extreme except that it overcomes him. Meaning, don't go to an o- excessive in your, in, your, in your devotion. Don't be excessive in your devotion because if you do that, it's going to overcome you. Meaning, you're going to burn out very quickly. So rather than focusing on one single act of worship and focusing on that, the Prophet of Allah says, the most beloved deeds to Allah are adwamuha wa in qalb are the ones that are continuous even if they're small. So this is in the domain of the Nawafil and your Sunan. If you have a small act of worship and you're doing it continuously, better than doing one big act of worship, you only do once in your, in your life. Okay? And so we spoke about the importance of having a wudud. And I think we all came up with, with some good ideas. And I, I gave you my ideas. And so, you know, who's still practicing? Who's praying in Boha? Very good, one, two, it's good, very good, mashallah. Good. 
You know, and I would remind you again of the the reward of the duha prayer that the Prophet Allah says that there are 360 joints in the body and duha is giving sadaqah for every joint in your body. Great way of saying thank you Allah. You know, that duha is the prayer of the who? Awwabheen. Who are the awwabheen? The ones who are continuously returning to Allah. Meaning, it's a prayer of those who always ask Allah for forgiveness. Awwabheen. You know? It's a very exclusive prayer, special prayer. We spoke about the fact that, you know, you can easily pray Turakat, Tahit al Wudu, we spoke about that. You know, all the, it's a very, it's just a, a ideas, but ways in which we can transform our daily patterns to establish a good practice that's continuous, even if it's small, but it's continuous, better than uh, focusing on, on the bigger things and you only do them once in a lifetime, for example. Um, and then we spoke about the most beloved deeds to Allah. The most beloved actions to Allah. You know, this, in, in the frame of that hadith, the ones that are continuous even if they're few. Basically, so far I think we've, we've understood the importance of ikhlas, of sincerity, the importance of having uh, of making sure our hearts are in the right place in our acts of worship. Some people, for example, you know, some people, uh, they, they complain about, you know, they could be praying Salah, they could be reciting Quran, whatever, but they don't feel the fullness, they don't feel the, uh, the presence, they don't feel as if the heart is in the right place. And really the fundamental issue is the training of the heart. It's the training of the heart. So the same way that a person who works out, Abrashi, you know my dear brother, you know, trains out, works his body, you know, the heart needs the same kind of training, if not more, more than that. So the way that you train your heart is, you know, you, you're cautious of your defects, of your faults, you're cautious of the fact that you have to ask for forgiveness continuously because the Prophet Allah says, uh, Adam khatta, all of the sons of Adam are sinners, make mistakes, وَخِرْ الْخَطَّئِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the awabin are the tawabun, by the way. So the best of the sons of Adam who make mistakes and sins are those who constantly, all the time, are seeking Allah's forgiveness. All the time. So training of the heart, meaning not allowing the heart to reach a point of ascendancy to the point where that soul, that heart, looks down upon other people. So for example, the hadith about kibar, about pride, when Prophet Allah says, kibar is, the meaning of kibar is that you... Uh, look down upon people and turn away from the truth. That's what the Prophet Allah says that kibar means because the Bakr was concerning to Rasulullah. <coughs> I have, you know, lengthy clothes because, uh, because, uh, because he wasn't very big, but skinny, and the, the garment would go longer, you know. And uh, the Prophet Allah says that that's not pride. But pride is that you turn away from the truth and you look down upon people. And by the way, the hadith about the Isbal about what comes down from, you know, what comes down, let's say from the waist downwards you know, for the man, uh, beyond his feet. Now the hadith does say that anything beyond, beyond the feet is in the fire. But the hadith says about khuyala, it says the one who is doing it out of pride, ostentation. So uh, it's not necessarily that the, the garment hanging down is, is by itself forbidden, unless the heart is doing it out of pride. And also it's a kind of cultural thing as well because nowadays, I don't think nowadays, um, at least in England, at least uh, as far as I know, that's not seen much as a symbol of pride. But maybe in the Arab world and other places that's seen as a symbol of, or was seen as a symbol of pride, you know. But my point is that the, the key defining thing is khuyala, which means out of pride, ostentation, to show off. That's that's fundamentally in the fire, that's fundamentally haram, you know, uh, extravagance and so on and so forth. And so therefore now we're on chapter 3, which is the meaning of Saddidu wa qaribu. So Ibn Rajab says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, he's saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, he's saying salam, in the hadith of Abu Hurairah and Aisha, wa saddidu wa qaribu, be firm, steadfast and balanced. Saddidu means to act with firmness and fortitude. It means to take a balanced part in worship not being deficient by leaving off what has been commanded with the obligations or by taking on more than one can bear you know like look for example islam came after the religion of or after the way of isa salam islam of isa salam you know but after his initial followers left what happened allah in the quran says that they invented for themselves monasticism 
which Allah did not, did not prescribe for them. Allah in the Quran says that. You know, they invented for themselves manasism which Allah didn't prescribe. So for example, that led to things like celibacy. So, you know, refusing to marry, for example, which led to other sins, other crimes that are prevalent even today. Uh, but in the frame of, of that monasticism are extremes. That's not to say it's not good to be, in some ways, uh, having sometimes uh, times, moments of khalwa. We believe that like, i'tikaf is khalwa. You seclude yourself, you know. But you don't make that a lifetime ambition. I'm going to live in, in i'tikaf. You don't say every day is an i'tikaf. You don't say every day is my day of khalwa. You have moments of khalwa. Like your time in sajda is a moment of khalwa between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your private moment, maybe no one's watching, but you're making a dhikr of Allah, that's a private moment of khalwa. I'tikaf is khalwa. But if you take it to an excess, an extreme, that means, I, like the Sahabi, he said, I'm never going to sleep with my wife, I'm never going to, I'm going to fast and never break my fast. And the Prophet says to him, well, listen, you know, I, I fast and I break the fast. You know, and I, you know, and he's saying, and he's telling him, then he says, man raghiba an sunnati farisa minni, that's the hadith. Whoever raghiba an sunnati, whoever turns away from my sunnah, it's not from me. So don't make your own religion by saying, just, I think this is good, and so I'll do it. But what if it becomes a practice then? Maybe for you, in small doses, for example, I could say, I could train myself. I could say, you know what? I want to have a practice because I want to train myself. I remember the day when my son was small. Remember, you remember? Uh, you know, there was a boxing match. And it happened at Fajr time. And usually these big matches happen around that time, isn't it? <laughs> Boxing match, you know, bunch of time. And I remember the other family members had gathered and they were going to watch it. And, uh, and I took my son to the masjid at the fajr time. So he could deliberately miss it. Because <laughs> you have to break something in you. And I said to him, I said, brother, I said, Reba, I'm going to show you the real heavyweights today. <laughs> and the people that first up <laughs> are the real heavyweights. You know, I mean, you have to overcome something. Like, for example, going to the masjid when it's raining. And it's raining and it's damp and it's dark and it's dull. You don't feel like it. But to break that in you is part of breaking something in the nafs. Everybody has, everybody has to do that. Your path to Allah, you have to, you have to take the steps. Doing some things that you don't really like to do, for example. We, you have to do them to overcome something. And so, doing that in small doses for you at a personal level is fine. But to make it a full-time whole practice is problem. So Christians, for example, uh, in some of the monastic orders, they had a thing called a stylite, Simeon, Simeon the stylite, a very famous person. And so in Sham, in Syria, uh, they used to erect these huge columns. Huge columns. And then one of those, in, 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 in full devotion, would climb up and get right at the top and live there until he dies. Meaning once you're up, you're not coming down <laughs> unless you die. <laughs> and then volunteers, pious volunteers would come and give them food. But they can't come down. That's, that's it. It's finished. You read about it. It's called stylite, stylite movement. So famous of the stimulus stylite. And there's others. You know, and that was the whole thing. Just climb up the whole thing, very tall and stay up there. Very small space you have to move around, but you're going to live there and you're going to die there. Well, that's the problem. Imagine everyone does that. <laughs> Imagine everybody does that. Problem. So Allah says, uh, Allah says, Allah didn't command it, they invented it for themselves. So everything in small, in, in, in proportion. There was a man who was Zahid. Zahid is someone who didn't, uh, you know, he didn't care much for the dunya. You know, Allah granted Zuhid. Zuhid is a good thing. You know, he didn't eat that much, he didn't drink that much, he used to focus on worship. And it's important to have some zuhud in your life as well. And so, Abdul Mubarak, you know, he came, he heard about the money, he went to visit him. Ibn Mubarak, Rahmatullahi who was one of the greatest scholars of the Islam at the time. And he goes to see him, and he, uh, the, the, someone answered the door, and he answered, entered the door. And he sees this man in the corner of the house, of the room, and he's just making dhikr of Allah. Because he's the Zayd. I mean, he's famous. You're making dhikr of Allah, dhikr of Allah, dhikr of Allah. Uh, so much, he doesn't even pay attention to who's coming inside the house. He's not concerned. His concern is only dhikr of Allah. And Ibn Mubarak, you know, he thinks, okay, well, he spends time with other people in the house, and he, then he leaves. 
And when he leaves, the people came to the man and he says, what's wrong with you? You didn't give, you know, this is your guest and you're supposed to host your guest and it's in Mubarak. And he was so shaken up that he, he, he ran after him. And he says to him, I'm so sorry, I didn't know it was you. I didn't know it was you. Advise me. And then he says, listen, my advice to you is that لَا تَخْرُجْ مِنْ مَنْزِلِكْ وَتَلْقَى رَجُلًا مُسْلِمًا إِلَّا رَأَيْتُ لَكَ فَضَّلًا He says, golden advice, he said, never leave your home and see another servant of Allah, Muslim, except that you would see that that person has a virtue over you. Has a virtue over you. Never leave your home thinking you're the best person that lives on this street. That you're the best person. That you, no. Opposite. That you would see yourself, I'm the most, I have the most deficiencies. So Zunimur would say that, Umm al-Khattab would say that, the, the ones who are older are better than me because they have more good deeds than me. The ones who are younger are better because they have less sins than me. I'm just floating in the middle somewhere. <laughs> and so he says, uh, when you leave your home, someone assume that he's better than you. You know. So another Ibn Sumail, uh, Shumail said, uh, as Sadad means to take the path of balance in the religion. All right. Um, now similarly, qaribu means the same thing, taking to a path between deficiency and excessive, between deficiency and excessiveness, in the middle. As such, there are two words carrying the same or similar meanings. This is a meaning of his words, وسلم, in the other narration, stick to a middle path. Now his sayings, وسلم, upon which have glad tidings from the other narration, وَأَبْشِرُوا So, سَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا so, sadidu qaribu and have glad tidings means that whoever obeys Allah upon firmness and balance for him are glad tidings. That's the explanation. Right? So, sadidu qaribu wa abshiru, meaning be balanced and firm and then have the glad tidings because of your being balanced and firm. Uh, because you will reach the goal and outstrip the one who expends a great deal of effort in performing deeds. Right? So, whole point is it's like the it's like the story of the what is that story of the tortoise tortoise and the what the tortoise and the hare <laughs> that the tortoise you know who keeps himself who measures his paces you know and, and takes a road and will get to the end but if you expend your efforts all at one go thinking life is a sprint rather than a marathon uh, you know, you might end up in trouble. Because there could be a point where you, you feel burned out. As if, oh, you know, you, you feel you, your efforts are, are gone. Whereas the one who takes things slowly at pace with sincerity and khushur and measure uh, is a better person. The path of balance and firmness is better than all other paths. Being, ba being balanced in following the sunnah is better than striving hard in other than it. All right, so, um, yeah, it's like the narration we mentioned, I think, once, I can't remember, when uh, Umar al-Khattab, he sees, uh, he, they conquer Jerusalem, and he sees uh, a monk coming out of a monastery, and the monk was all disheveled, disheveled, weak, old, frail, you know, all over the place, and Umar began to cry began to weep. And they said, why do you weep when today is a day of fat, a day of victory and success for the Ummah? The Prophet says that, you know, he mentioned six of the signs at the end of time and he says, first is my death and then the conquest of Jerusalem. So it was the first big conquest after the Prophet's death, the conquest of Jerusalem. And then he says, um, uh, yeah, we should be rejoicing. We shouldn't be so sad, You're crying. And uh, Omar says, because of what I see, he says, haven't you heard the words of Allah in Quran? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ وَجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذَا نَخَاشِيَةِ عَامِلَةُ النَّاصِبَةِ Allah says, has, has, the new, has the news of the overwhelming day reached you? You know, when faces that they will be humiliated, عَامِلَةُ النَّاصِبَةِ uh, Working, toiling with fatigue. And Umar saw that person in the, through the prism and lens of this verse. Meaning, there's going to be people on that day who would have done so many things, but 
Allah in the Quran says, Qul hal unabi'ukum bil akhsarina a'mala. Should I tell you who are the, the, the worst losers on that day? Alladheena dhalla sa'yuhum fil hayatul dunya. Those whose efforts are wasted in this life. And sa'yu means effort, labor. You know, working hard, working hard. People, they do like, for example, so much, but in the name of Ganesh, in the name of Hanuman, in the name of Jesus, in the name of, you know, other things. I mean, that's going to be, that will get nobody anything. Yom al All right, so, uh, the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Sallam. Whoever traverses his path will find it closer to Allah than any at the path. Virtue is not attained by doing a great deal of outward deeds, rather it is attained by deeds being sincere for Allah and being correct in that they are done in accordance to the Sunnah. And through gnosis of the heart, meaning gnosis meaning khushu of the heart and its uh, actions. You know, once Ibn Mas'udi says, Allah peace with him, he says, Man kana mustannan falyastanna man qadmat. Whoever wants to follow a path should follow the path of those who have died, meaning Sahaba, because they were abaruha quluban wa amakwa ilman wa akalu wa Three reasons he gave why you should follow Sahaba. He says because they had the most pious of hearts, abaruha quluban, and the deepest of knowledge, and they were the least pretentious. They were the least showing off people. So follow those people. Whereas he says then the people who are alive today haven't yet escaped from their fitna. Like you don't know what state a person might die of. If you say I'm gonna follow a living person, well, okay, maybe in some things you could work if he's following Islam. But if you say I'm gonna give my life for this person, then what if that person ends up being a cheat? How many stories do you have of people who were like it happens in America or how you have you know, we have people from the subcontinent, in India, going over to America teaching people things like yoga. Yoga, and like, you know, learning about the this, this soul and this heart, you know. And then, they, and then they are corrupt. They themselves are corrupt, you know. And it becomes a business scheme. And then people, they think this must be the, the best thing ever. They give their life savings, you know, for these, for these people. There's a very famous story of... Uh, What's that uh, person? Uh, it's the largest suicide. It's the largest mass suicide in human history. What's Jimmy Jones? Jimmy Jones, yeah. And Jimmy Jones, he's just like he was a, He's not not like a theologian, but he had charisma about him. So around him, he creates you know a community. Elderly people gave their life savings, the jewelry to him. Then how he became make money. And then when he made the money, you know, his story was, you know, when the, the government is concerned because people are complaining, and then they sent in some governors to go and uh, check it out by helicopter, they came in. And when they, they came in, uh, they, he put up on, on a show. So he got all of his followers to kind of make it sing and kind of, you know, have the singing and look as if this is a, a beautiful heaven place. And then when, when he was about to leave, one of the girls ran up and gave him a note saying, please save me. And then he brought on an airplane, then he, he freaked out. Then he took his people with the guns and then they shot the governor to death. And, they, and then that's the night where they said, uh, where he said, this is our night, we're going to meet Jesus today. You know? Heaven is awaiting us today. And then he uh, made all of them kill themselves. 900 people in one night suicide and they all drank poison he himself he shot himself <laughs> he drank, drank, drank the poison <laughs> so that's the problem so if you sacrifice everything for a living person you don't know what state that living person is going to die on whereas those who have died already Allah says Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah you know so Whoever has more knowledge of Allah, His religion, and His ordinances, and, and has more fear, hope, and love for Him, is better than one who has not attained His level, even if the latter do more outward deeds. Who can give me an example of that? Give me an example. 
One example is of the, the alim and the abid in the hadith of the man who killed 99 people. One man killed 99 people and then he goes to the abid. The abid is the devout servant of Allah. He's not a scholar, but he just worships. He's a worshiper. And so the, the murderer goes to the abid and says, listen, I've killed 99 people. Can Allah ever forgive me? And the man says, never. How can Allah forgive you? You're a mass murderer. And he was so angry, he killed him also. Therefore, he killed a hundred people. Then some time passed, and he went to who? The alim, the one who knows, the scholar. And he says, well, can Allah forgive me? And he says, yeah, but you're in the wrong place with the wrong people, wrong company, wrong crowd. Everything's messed up with you. You change your life and get out of where you are, meaning move place, find a new company with worshippers and just worship Allah and perhaps Allah can forgive you. And the man then, that's what he did. And then the man died and Allah forgave the man. And the hadith is a long hadith. But the point is, this: the difference between the abid and the alim. Because the abid, he wouldn't know what answer to give. He has knowledge, he has knowledge and conviction of Allah, sincere devotion, but not with the knowledge that can help him. You know? So that's something you know, fundamental for us as Muslims. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, it, and his ordinance is, and has more fear, hope, and love for him is better than, and also knowing when to have more fear and hope and love for him. It's sad. I was, you know, a few months ago, I was asked to do a talk, to do a chapter from a book for a, a, a book club here in Slough you know, and they're doing an Islamic book, and so I was doing the one chapter for them, and, um, and, I, and I was speaking about the love of Allah, and I think even the chapter has, has stuff on the love of Allah. And one of the brothers said, you know, I thought we were reading a Christian book. And I said, it's a sad, dismal reality. Why are we the least to speak about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah's beautiful names Al-Wadud, you know, like forgiveness and mercy are emanations of his mawadd, of his love for Allah, of his love for his creation and his servants and his and his servants. You know, so that's stressed so much in the Quran, Allah's love for his servants. And love is not something like like Allah's rahmah, Allah's mercy is unto all people, unto everybody. Everybody has a part of Allah's mercy, even the disbelievers, even the shayateen, every, even everything. Allah, Allah sends love between all people, sorry, mercy between all people. وَأَنزَلَ مِنْهَا رَحْمَةً وَحِدَةً بَيْنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسُ وَالْبَهَائِمِ Even insects have something from Allah. Everything has from the love of Allah, mercy of Allah. But love is something that is unique. Love of Allah is something unique. Like love is something that is reserved for the special servants of Allah. So unlike the Christians who say that God loves you. So I, the book I wrote, by the way, is responding to a, a guy called Dr. William Lane Craig, who says that the love of God is three. It's universal, it's impartial, and it's unconditional. Think about that. Universal, impartial, unconditional. That means God loves everybody and there's no questions asked. Yeah, but then does God love hate? Does God love the opposite of love? Does God love the ones who, you know, I mean, if you stretch it so far, it becomes quite ridiculous. Because that means God can love you and you could do anything and God will still love you. That means no gradients of love. That means actually there's no such thing called love because there's no way of knowing what's a high love and low love. You know, it's all one and the same thing. And the criminal over there who doesn't even believe in God, God loves him. And the one who believes in God, God loves him. The same, that means, you know, what then, what, what is the meaning then of love? It's not like that. You know, you have to work hard, be sincere uh, for some things in life. But the mercy element is Allah gives everybody a chance. That's the difference. Allah gives everybody a chance. That's from the mercy of Allah. Allah gives everybody a chance. And what makes it so beautiful is that Allah, Allah allows everybody to begin from a, the most beautiful basis of the fitrah, 
every child is born pure, the Prophet of Allah says, on fitrah. That means in everybody is this innate disposition where you believe in Allah. And I tell people, because I do mentoring for people who have problems in the faith, I said, it doesn't take that much. Like, I don't need to look into scientific stuff you know, for me to be convinced of anything. I don't have to read science books to, to show, is there proof that, you know, I, uh, we don't need any of this. Just look at yourself in the mirror. And that's enough as a proof. Enough of a proof. Look at your fingers, your hands. Look at your eyes, your nose, lips, moustache. Everything in you is enough of a proof. You don't even need to know all this. Allah in the Quran says, "Am min khalikun." Were they created from nothing? Or were they the creator? Or were they created by, heaven, by the Lord of heavens and the earth? So if you think about that, were you created from nothing? Or were you yourself the creator of all? Was the Lord of heavens and the earth who created? Question. So, um, uh, this understanding is derived from the hadith of Aisha, be firm, steadfast, and balanced upon, a, upon which have glad tidings, for indeed actions will not cause one to enter paradise. The most beloved deeds to Allah, those that are done continuously and persistently, even if they are few. Therefore, he ordered us to take a middle path in deeds and to add to this knowledge of the most beloved deeds to Allah, um, I mean the continuous ones, and be informed us that deeds alone will not cause one to enter, enter paradise. It is for this reason that some of the Salaf said, Abu Bakr did not outstrip you by virtue of much fasting or prayer, but rather because of something that has taken root in his heart. So something that takes root in his heart. You know, the love of Allah. Some of them said what was in the heart of Abu Bakr was the love of Allah and sincerity to seven. Because in your life, whatever, whatever, wherever your heart is, wherever, wherever your heart is, you know, your actions are a reflection of the workings of your heart. Your speech is a reflection of the workings of your heart. Wherever you tread in life, reflection of the workings of your heart. Wherever you look, whatever you hear, whatever you say, reflection of the working of your heart. This is why if you focus on this, it will make everything that you do in life so much more beautiful. You know, Allah says about uh, Ibrahim, is it Ibrahim? Wajarabuhu, Wajarabu, is it Ibrahim? Wajarabu bi kalbin salim. And when he came to his Lord with a sound heart. And Ibrahim then says, it was Ibrahim says, That on that day nothing will benefit the people, not their wealth, not their kids, the kids want to come to Allah with a sound heart. So the merchandise on that day is not going to be how good your kids were. You know, how much money you have, it's going to be what heart you're presenting to Allah. So it's saying that Abu Bakr was not known to be the best of all companions because of the fact that he fasted more and he prayed more. For sure he fasted a lot and prayed a lot, but by something that rested in his heart. And that is love of Allah and sincerity to the believer. So beautiful dua, we should try and learn. It says, Allah marzuqni hubba. The Prophet says, Allah marzuqni hubba. Oh Allah, grant me your love. Wa hubba. Man yinfani hubba wa indak. And the love of those who benefit me to love you. Allahumma, ma razaqtani mimma uhib. Faj'alu quwatan li fi ma tuhib. Oh Allah, whatever you've given me, whatever I love, make it mean to me to do what you love. Wa ma zawayta anni mimma uhib. Faj'alu faragan li fi ma tuhib. Whatever you've taken from me, whatever I loved, make it a means for me to do what you love. What a beautiful dua. So, if you're on the mailing list, I'll uh, ask Omar to forward this to all of you and try your best to learn it. You have to learn it like in one go, 
because it's quite longer, but you can break it up. Even the first part of it is beautiful. Allah is easy to say, Allah ma zukni hubbak. Oh Allah grant me your love. Because you want Allah to love you. Allah ma zukni hubbak. Oh Allah grant me your love. Allah ma zukni hubbak. And rizq, by the way, rizq, don't think rizq is only money. <laughs> rizq isn't just money. Rizq is all blessings. Rizq is happiness. You know? Rizq is afia. Preservation of the body. Rizq is all these things. And you're saying that the most important rizq is Allah to love you. Allah marzukani hubbak. Oh Allah grant me your love. But I'll ask Umar to send the, the whole dua to all of you inshallah. Um, therefore he ordered us to take a middle path. Okay. So therefore, yeah. So sincerity servants and um, and this is why, you know, things like negative negative emotions negative energy like envy and uh, resentment these things easily corrupt the heart it's not that easy I know because if we, we're human beings we live with other people we don't like all people it's not saying that you like everyone it's saying that, you know, you're going to have people that you don't get along with that's fine but it's saying don't have that malice in your heart that you sleep with you know what's the story of a uh, is it Sa'd ibn Waqqas? When uh, the Prophet says the first one to enter the masjid is going to be in Jannah. And it was Sa'd. Remember. Then it happens the same thing next day. And the same thing the third day. And the Sahaba was saying, we want to know why, why, why is he singled out to enter Jannah? And so one Sahabi made an excuse, he said, I, I want to spend the night with you. Sleep at your place. Just check him out. <laughs> what is he doing that what I'm not doing? <laughs> what must he be doing that's so unique that I'm not doing? And, uh, and then you know, when the day, the night, day passed, night passed, and he said to me, you know what? The Prophet says you'll be in Jannah, but there's nothing that you do that I don't do. You pray, I pray. You fast, I fast, you give sadaqah, I give sadaqah, you pray tahajjud, I pray tahajjud, we all do the same thing. What is it then? Is I can't think of anything. But one thing is, when I sleep, before I sleep, in my heart, I've forgiven everyone. So I don't carry any malice through with me. The man says it, may, it must be because of, of this. You know, sir, it's not about what, what, what's being shown in your out of outer body what's resting inside of you that's that's what's going to count you know for you fundamentally so um, none has reached the heights none who reached the heights did so through a great deal of fasting and prayer rather through generosity of soul soundness of heart and sincerity to the nation some added and censure to their own uh, and censure to their own souls what does that mean who knows what does it mean to censure your own soul? Keep That's good. To keep, keep control of yourself. To tell yourself off. Sorry? Self-restraint. Yeah, self-restraint, very good. To censure your soul means to reprimand yourself. You know, to reprimand yourself. You know, to check yourself. To question yourself. To account yourself. Umar would say, Hasibu and Fusakum Kabul and to Hasabu. Account yourself before you are taken to account. Was you knew her Kabul and Tuzanu. Away you are these before they wait for you. You can't do that unless you're censuring yourself. And sometimes you have to be harsh on yourself, meaning uh, you might make a mistake, but to correct that mistake, you know you have to you have to check yourself. I don't want to make that mistake again. Or the way that you make, you make, uh, you know, you make up for that mistake. Could be that you made a mistake, but now you want to do more to make up for that mistake. More of istighfar or tawbah or sadaqah or something good to wipe away the bad deed. You know, all of these things are helpful and beneficial. Um, uh, one of them said the difference in, in their ranking lay in their objectives and intent. Not in a great deal of fasting and prayer. 
objective than intent. You know? So one of the obvious ones is whenever you work as a community, sometimes sometimes it happens that different, you know, people become jealous of the achievements of others, or you might have different organizations and one is doing well, other one's not doing too well, you know. You know. Uh, how how would you understand that in light of objective? If you make it so that you realize that the soul, you could say, I guess the soul, one of the soul objectives of life, when it comes to things that you do, is so that Allah is remembered more. Sahaba so said, who is the one who is a mujahid? Which one is a real mujahid? He said, some people, they fight for to be called brave. He said, that one is not a mujahid. Some that could fight for money, that one's not a mujahid either. He says, Man qatal litakuna Whoever fights to make the word of Allah the highest, then that is in the way of Allah. So if you, whatever you do, you want to make the word of Allah the highest. You want to make Allah remembered more. You know, when, Mus, when Allah sent Musa to who, Fir'aun, and Allah said, go to Fir'aun because he's transgressed the limits. Musa, Musa said, okay, I'll go, but I've got this problem with my talking. رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسْتِرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْعُقْدِ means a knot unloose a knot from my مِلِّسَانِ يَفْقَوْ قَوْلِي people can understand what I'm saying وَجْعَلْ لِي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي هَارُونَ أَخِي and send me a supporter from my family my brother Harun so he's asking Allah for all this extra ammunition and Allah says fine Allah sent Harun with him but still he asks Allah what? No, sorry, what did you say to Allah? Send Harun, okay. Send uh, Harun with me, okay? نُسَبِّحَكَ كَثِيرًا وَنَذْكُرُكَ كَثِيرًا Look at this, really, really profound, really profound. He says, oh Allah, send Harun with me so we could remember you more and we could glorify you more. That's purpose. That's objective. So I could do it, fine. We could do it. Allah is remembered more. More goodness is achieved if we do it together. And if you have that in your mind, it will help you. Whenever you have different people, you know, different whatever, you think in your mind, our whole perspective is we want to make sure Allah is remembered more. To make the word of Allah the highest, you know. Uh, how are we for time? It's 8 o'clock. Okay, we'll finish inshallah in a minute then. Wrap up. Um, yeah. Okay. I think it's, I think we should we can wrap up now then. Inshallah. Um, there's quite a lot left for this section, but I want to thank you all guys all again you know, for your attendance today. Inshallah. And I apologize for the fact that we took three weeks break, um, but Inshallah, let's try and continue things. If anybody, Umar said, anybody is new today, then contact him. You can go on the mailing, mailing list, inshallah, for any updates, inshallah. Uh, and also, uh, I'll ask Umar to put up the dua about love of Allah that we can try and, and learn. Even if you don't memorize it, just read it, isn't it? But the first part is easy. Allah, Allah, that's easy to learn, inshallah. So, Allah, 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 Yeah, inshallah.